Hey guys, Weeby News here, and today we'll be covering a new update for Master Detective Archives, Raincode, which is a new upcoming game by the creator of Danganronpa. I've been covering this game quite a lot on my channel because I'm super duper excited for it. So if you haven't heard about it at all, I recommend checking out those videos first. In today's video, we're gonna be discussing the characters because Spike Chunsoft recently released 16 character profiles and illustrations. And yes, there were 16 characters revealed. Sounds familiar, I know. And oh my gosh, the illustrations look so freaking good. They're made by Kamatsuzaki, who was the main concept artist for Danganronpa. So a lot of these splash arts do remind me a lot of the splash arts from Danganronpa. And they look so freaking good. But yeah, there is also some new profiles released for these characters as well. Just kind of giving some insight to their personality as well as their forensic forte, which is like their supernatural ability that I mentioned in the last video. One of the main things I've been looking forward to with this game is just kind of like learning more about the new characters, especially these master detectives detectives, since they do remind me of like the ultimates from Danganronpa. I'm excited to see how big of a personality they have and just kind of learn about their backgrounds and what kind of stuff they've come up for them. Because I do think one of Danganronpa's biggest strengths is the fact that they put so much thought and effort into each character. So yeah, I'm super excited to see that we're finally getting some information on these guys and I want to make a video for it since I figured some of you guys might be interested in it as well. But yeah, without further ado, let's go ahead and get right into the video. So the article starts out talking about the World Detective Organization. It states an extra league extra privileged organization devoted to eradicating the world's unsolved mysteries. Their branches exist throughout the world, one of which is the Nocturnal Detective Agency in Kanai Ward. The key players in their activities are master detectives who possess forensic fortes, but ordinary detectives are also enlisted. Protagonist Yuma Kokohead suffers from amnesia. His background is unknown, but he was in possession of documents indicating that he was sent to Kanai Ward as a detective in training at the agency. So yeah, the only thing new here that I noticed regarding the detective agency is the fact that there are ordinary detectives that work there as well. I was honestly under the impression that it was only these types of like ultimate master detectives that worked here, but it's interesting to note that there's also some regular people working for them as well. I'm guessing they're more like these guys underlings, but I guess we'll see. But anyways, moving on to the character profiles. The first one is for Vivia Twilight, and he is this emo looking guy here. He has a decadent and aesthetic atmosphere about him, often lying down in various places, such as the fireplace at the agency or under the hotel's grand piano. His personality can be described as self-indulgent. His forensic forte is spectral projection. Freed from the flesh, the ghost form can pass through walls and floors without being seen by other people. So basically, he can turn into a ghost in inner places that normally you couldn't. And you actually get to see his little ghost form in his illustration right here. I'm guessing his ability will come in handy when we want to check out areas that are normally restricted to us. I could also see it being used to spy on conversations and stuff too, though. It also seems like one of his main personality traits is going to be the fact that he's lazy. I could definitely see him being the type of character character to just like fall asleep randomly, even while like standing up like Chiaki did in Danganronpa 2. Next up is Aphex Logan. Born to lawyer parents, he lost them at an early age and lived a rough life in the slums from then on. Due to these circumstances, he tends to be rude and tries to solve problems with violence. His forensic forte is life detection. The location of any living thing within a 50 meter radius can be found. We actually saw him use this ability in the recent trailer, so it's pretty cool to actually get an explanation as to what exactly it is. But yeah, I'm super excited for this guy. He's already got a trauma dump already. I'm definitely interested in learning more about his life and all the hardships he went through. Something that's interesting is that he was born to parents who were lawyers and lawyers make a lot of money. So you would think that once they died, he would inherit all that money. I'm kind of wondering if something happened to the money in between the time that they died and him going to the slums. Since yeah, I feel like he should be inheriting that. I guess maybe some other family members could have tried to screw him over and taken it from him or his parents hated him and didn't even leave him in the will. Not really sure, but it's just kind of an interesting thing I wanted to point out. But yeah, he definitely seems like he'll be a character who's hot-headed and he's definitely somebody I can see kind of acting rashly without thinking first. So I feel like whatever case we work on with him, I could definitely see him causing trouble, but I could also see him getting an arc where he learns to like calm down and think a bit more before he acts. Next up is Zange Eraser. I'm assuming that's how you pronounce his name. A quiet old detective with a solemn expression of a battle-hardened veteran. He never talks about his past, but his style of speech suggests ties to a government organization. His forensic forte is thoughtography. His memory can be transcribed as a thoughtographic image onto electronic devices, such as a smartphone. Seems like a very, very useful talent. Also, is it just me or does this guy look like cartoonishly evil? I mean, like, it almost seems too obvious for him to be like the twist villain at the end of the game, but damn, he looks evil. 
especially in this one screenshot. Look at that smile, dude, and the red eyes. Eh. It also mentions that, like, it's implied through his speech that he has ties to a government organization. And since they've been pushing in the trailers a lot that the Kane Ward is corrupt and controlled by a mega corporation, it does make me feel like he at least at some point worked closely with that mega corporation, which makes him suspicious, but also, like, too suspicious in a way. I feel like especially for the fact that he does just look so comically villain-like. I feel like even his forensic talent is kind of suspicious too. Like, I could totally see us somehow getting, like, a memory transcribed from him that's, like, of him, like, murdering somebody in the first-person perspective. It's like, wow, why do we find a picture of Zange standing over a dead body with blood all over him and a knife in his hand? That's so weird. He would never, though, right? He's just a cute little old man. But yeah, it almost feels like it's too suspicious for him to be, like, the twist villain at the end of this. But I'm not gonna stop thinking he looks like a villain until it's proven otherwise. Next up is Zilch Alexander. He loves the harmony between people and nature and specializes in dealing with those who would try to disrupt it. His tendency toward leading the conversation and moving things along efficiently sometimes gives off the impression of arrogance to those around him. His forensic forte is animal investigation. He controls animals to gather intelligence, even in areas inaccessible to humans. I cannot wait for this guy. I can't wait to control a little cat who gets to investigate a secret room. That's gonna be so freaking cute. But yeah, I like this guy a lot so far, mostly because I like animals animals a lot. And so far, I gotta say, he reminds me a lot of Gundam. I'm not sure if he'll be like a big chuny like Gundam though. It kind of seems like his personality is going to be super serious and arrogant right now, but we'll see. Also, this dog in this flash art is supposed to be based off of Kadaka's dog, the creator of the game, as well as Danganronpa. He even posted a picture showing like a comparison between the two, and it's pretty cute, I'm not gonna lie. Next up is Desuhiko Thunderbolt, a young man with a goofball nature who likes hitting on women under the guise of investigation. Desuhiko's goal is to become famous as a mystery solving superstar detective. He carries a huge backpack filled with tools necessary for his disguises. His forensic forte is disguise. In addition to disguising his clothes and face, his voice, height, and weight can also be changed, allowing him to match the target of disguise visually and psychologically. It mentions that he can disguise himself psychologically too, but I am still kind of curious to see his um, talent when it comes to acting. I could totally see him losing focus while in disguise and kind of like blowing our cover, you know what I mean? Like for example, he's supposed to be talking to like a main suspect of the murder scene. So he goes to their office, but their secretary is super cute. So he gets super distracted and starts hitting on her and like totally forgets about the mission. I could definitely see him being a character you have to like redirect a lot. A kind of dark idea regarding his talent though would be like, what if one of the other master detectives dies on a case and somebody's like just really torn up about it and they didn't get to say like a final goodbye or something along those lines. I could honestly see him like dressing up as that deceased detective so that the person who still doesn't have closure can like kind of get that closure in a way. I feel like that could be like an emotional scene that he could potentially be in, but just a bit of an idea. Another thing I noticed about Desuhiko is the fact that his splash art looks kind of similar to Samugi's from B3, since they're both surrounded by like costumes and stuff. I don't really think it means anything, but I thought it could still be interesting to point out. Next up is Hilara Nightmare. Hilara is always cool under fire and has solved many difficult cases through precise judgment. Hilara only believes in money and will not accept a request without payment, regardless of who the client may be. Her forensic forte is postcognition, the ability to see how a crime scene appeared at the time it was first discovered. Like I said in my last video, I feel like this talent's going to be used for a pretty important case. I can definitely see it being used in a case where the one that we're working on connects to some murder trial that happened in the past. Like, for example, they have the same culprit, but the culprit for that previous case was either never found or they charged the wrong person. So I can almost see the case that we work on with her being more of an end game or at least a big turning point in the game. Her design's really cute though. She kind of reminds me of Chiaki here, except her personality is more like Mr. Krabs from SpongeBob, being like so money obsessed. But yeah, I'm pretty excited to see what they do with her character, especially since, yeah, I do feel like her talent could be very, very useful. Next up is Pucky Lavman. Despite her childlike appearance, she has a machine-like composure and mental processing speed, perhaps because she avoids communication. She sometimes shows awkward reactions and intense displays of emotion during conversation. Her forensic forte is audio aptitude. By concentrating, whispers, footsteps, and even heartbeats can be heard from far away. The main thing I noticed about this girl is that her splash art looks a lot like Chiaki's from Danganronpa 2. They're both kind of sitting in the same position. The pin in her hair also looks a lot like Usami from Danganronpa 2 as well. I'm not really sure if all of this means anything, but I thought it still might be interesting to point out. And I'm going to talk about some spoilers for Danganronpa 2 here, so I would skip to this timestamp if you haven't played that game. The main thing that I think this could be implying regarding her character is that like Chiaki, maybe she's like an AI or a robot of some sort. Another reason I was thinking this is because her profile kind of describes 
describes her almost in a robot-like way, saying she has machine-like composure and mental processing speeds. It sounds like they're talking about a computer. It would be kind of weird if she was the only robot among the master detectives, though, since they all have, like, these amazing abilities. But I guess the detective agency could be trying to create detectives, and maybe she could be, like, the first one or the first really successful one. Even her personality seems kind of not human. It says she avoids communication, and her reactions are awkward, and she'll just kind of, like, randomly have intense displays of emotion. So I feel like it could be, like, her programming trying to figure out how to act human, but it just, like, doesn't know how. I'm not totally convinced of this theory, but I thought it was something interesting to point out. Let me know what you guys think. Next up is Fubuki Clockford. Because of her upbringing as a lady of the world-famous Clockford family, she is a bit naive. She has a uniquely peculiar way of thinking, which can frustrate and confuse the people she talks to. Her forensic forte is time leap. Time can be rewound and things can be redone. After time has been turned back once, it cannot be turned back beyond that point, however. Based on the screenshot, too, she seems pretty out of it. And, like, her memory is pretty bad. Because she mentioned she forgot what she had for breakfast that morning and can't even remember how she got to the place she's at now. I'm kind of curious to see how they control this ability because it seems really overpowered to me, honestly. Like, couldn't she possibly just, like, rewind time and stop a murder from happening if she wanted to? I think my biggest guess to how they're going to control this power and not make it too overpowered is the fact that once she turns back time, she can't turn back beyond a certain point. And like I said in the screenshot, she seems pretty out of it, so I could honestly see her, like, rewinding time for really stupid reasons. Like, she can't remember what she had for breakfast that morning, so she, like, rewinds time to see if she had, like, a bagel or cereal. And then when she shows up to the detective agency and they're like, hey, can you rewind time back to 6 p.m. last night when the murder took place? She's like, oh, sorry, I used it this morning already. I had a bagel. I can see the agency getting really frustrated with her if that's the case. Next up is Malami Goldmine, a glamorous woman with a keen intellect behind her flamboyant appearance. She's a fashionista whose mind is often focused on clothes. She's quick to like anyone with a body type that would suit her favorite outfits. Her forensic forte is spiritism. One's own body is used as a medium to summon the soul of a deceased person. In order to use this ability, she must wear the clothes the deceased wore in life. I love her makeup and her style. Look at her eyelashes, they're like both different colors. Uh, it looks so pretty. I like, too, the fact that her forte also fits her personality as, like, a fashionista. The fact that she has to wear clothes in order to, like, understand a person. Also, for this section, I'm going to be talking about spoilers for Danganronpa 1, so skip to this timestamp if you want to avoid it. But yeah, the main thing I want to say about her is the fact that she's described as a fashionista. And we all know who was the ultimate fashionista. Junko Inoshima herself, baby. It probably doesn't mean anything. I just find it very peculiar that they used that word to describe this girl when that's the exact talent of Junko. And kind of even reading her profile, their personalities do seem a little similar too. Like Malami is described as a glamorous woman with a keen intellect that you wouldn't expect from someone who's a fashionista. And Junko is the same. Whether or not she'll use her keen intellect for good or evil, we'll have to see. I mostly think she's a red herring because, like, surely they wouldn't make, like, the twist mastermind of this game. A blonde fashionista. Surely not. But Kadaka does love Junko so freaking much, apparently. So I don't know, maybe she will show up at the end. Honestly, if Junko shows up at the end of this game, I will chug a bottle of hot sauce on stream. And you guys can hold me to that. That's how bad I don't want this to happen. But yeah, most likely I do think she's going to be a red herring. But I still thought this was all interesting to kind of like point out and talk about. Next up is the head of the Nocturnal Detective Agency, Yako Furio. He's the head of the only agency in the Kanai Ward, the Nocturnal Detective Agency, an aloof and elusive man. Although not a master detective, he is certified by the World Detective Organization, which suggests that he is an excellent detective. That said, he is somewhat weak need, and his agency's policy is to stay quiet and refrain from any overt behavior that might lead to conflict with the Amaratsu Corporation peacekeepers. I think it's interesting that he's not a master detective, and it doesn't list a forensic forte for him either. It kind of makes me wonder if he does have one, we'll find out about it later, or if he's just so talented he didn't need one in order to work his way up the ranks and become the head of the agency. It's pretty interesting, too, that it seems like he's pretty hesitant when it comes to conflicting with the Amaratsu Corporation, especially their peacekeepers. It makes me wonder if he had some, like, horrible experience with them. Like, maybe they ended up killing his wife or his daughter or something along those lines. And so he just knows not to mess with them because he knows how much you can lose from doing so. I feel like this line from the screenshot, where he says, none who wish to live in peace dare defy them, kind of implies this could be the case. 
Next up, there's a description for the Amaterasu Corporation. It deals in a wide variety of goods, such as industrial products, electronic appliances, and pharmaceuticals, all which can be found across all aspects of daily life. On the other hand, many dark rumors surround the company, leading to a saying among detectives, kick it and the dust comes off like a wall of smoke. Despite that, both the government and the World Detective Organization have been unable to intervene because of its great influence. It also introduces some characters from this corporation too. The first character profile is for Yomi Hellsmile. His smile does look like it's from hell, doesn't it? The director of the Amaratsu Corporation Peacekeepers, despite having the face of a handsome young man, he is ruthless, finding joy in the misfortune of others, tearing people down, and even treating his underlings like expendable tools. He rules Kanai Ward with force and has established power within Amaterasu with his achievements. Next up is Martina Electro, the vice director of the Amaterasu Corporation Peacekeepers. She is Yomi's right hand and takes pride in the trust and affection he has for her. She has a coercive way with words and actions and has no mercy for those who defy her, becoming obedient only when Yomi is involved. So both of these characters actually appeared in the most recent Nintendo Direct trailer. You can see Yomi walking through a hallway, and you can see clips of a boss fight where it looks like we're fighting Martina. Honestly, I kind of thought the boss fight might be them together, considering their illustration is including both of them, but Martina appears to be alone in this, so maybe we'll have a separate fight for each of them. But just something kind of interesting I wanted to point out. I feel like these guys will be pretty entertaining. I definitely feel like Martina is the brains of the operation, while Yomi is kind of more the face of it. He's the intimidating face that's like loud and cruel in public, while she's the one who's probably actually making like most of the decisions for the peacekeepers. I'm very interested in seeing um, Yomi me though, since I like villains a lot and he seems like a little shithead. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll probably like him. Next up are the Amaterasu Corporation Peacekeepers. There's Swank Katsunel, a prideful member of the Amaterasu Corporation Peacekeepers, who loves money. This is the guy that we see in the first trailer that was released for Rain Code. It also appears like he might be the first boss, since we do see somebody that appears to be his shadow self in the dungeon area. I feel like he could be like a pretty good introduction for just showing how like slimy this corporation is, since he does look to be like a very comically evil character. Next up is Seth Burrows. Section Chief of Amaterasu Corporation Peacekeepers Investigations Team. A mumbling, unhealthy looking man, he habitually speaks through a megaphone to make up for his feeble voice. Next up is Guillaume Hall, leader of the counterterrorism squad, a boisterous, fast talking woman who tackles her work with enthusiasm and vigor. Then there's Dominique Fultank, second in command of the counterterrorism squad. He is over two meters tall. Though loyal to Guillaume and her orders, he sometimes has trouble following complex instructions. Guillaume's profile refers to her as a woman, but she honestly looks like really young to me. Like, I thought she was like 14 or 15 when I was reading this. I can't believe Dominic, who looks like the Danganronpa version of Cyborg, is following instructions from her. It does seem like he's loyal to her, but it mentions that he has issues following complex orders. I'm not sure if it just means that he's kind of like slow and can't understand complicated instructions, or if there is a part of him that doesn't respect her. I feel like it's probably the first interpretation though. But yeah, I don't really have too much to say about these guys. Their descriptions are pretty small in comparison, so it's kind of hard to have quite as much of an opinion regarding them. But yeah, let me know what you guys think about all these characters. Who are you? most excited about? Who's your favorite? Who's your least favorite? Do you agree with my opinions on them? Or is there anything else that you notice regarding them that you might want to point out in the comment section? I love theory building, so I'd love to read your comments on any theories you might have regarding these characters. There's also going to be a trailer coming out tonight at 7 p.m. Central Time, so I'll definitely be covering that too. I may do like a reaction to it and then try to like analyze it or something along those lines. I just wanted to get this video up before that since there's been a lot of news coming out for this game in the past like week or so. But yeah, once again, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please do leave a like and a comment and subscribe if you did and if you'd like for me to cover more rain code. But yeah, thanks again for watching and I will see you real soon.